guys for being here. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? Yeah. So I think it's my karma to, to be a drop-in because I'm actually a high school dropout. And I actually got kicked out of four schools. And uh, I really didn't find my, my sort of my passion, my love, my desire until I really discovered yoga. And then I just wanted to learn absolutely everything about this human life that I possibly could and still do. And that quest and that journey um, has taken me to India several times. Um, and India is such an incredible place. Have, has anyone been to India here in the audience? Yeah, a couple people. Well, we're going to take a little journey to India today. And I just want to warn you that it's going to be very bumpy. Um, I literally put this PowerPoint presentation together sitting on this chair about five minutes ago. Uh, these are photos from, from my trip recording the album Pilgrimage, which we did in 2010. And uh, one of the things that I should preference this talk with, because we'll do a little storytelling and we'll talk about some yoga philosophy and mythology and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, I just want to start by saying that none of this is definitive. This is as I experience it. It's not linear. They're not really hard facts. This is just what I've discovered in my personal journey and quest to try to understand who I am, why I'm here, why I was born, why I took this body. So this is sort of the, this is what I've discovered so far. And it's an ongoing process. So one of the things I like to do is, uh, is to tell stories. And if you ever heard some of my music, I enjoy ancient myths. I'm a big fan of Joseph Campbell some of the great storytellers of our time. And India has a very long, beautiful tradition of telling stories as a way to transmit teachings. Stories and myths are embedded, encoded with wisdom. And if we listen, we can decode the myths as we hear them. And as my good friend Sianna Sherman likes to say, we are every character in the story. So right from the gate, that just makes stories really, really interesting whether we're watching movies or reading novels or reading comic books, to see that every character in the story is an aspect of ourself makes the story very personal and very complex and awesome. So we're going to start with this first story, which is the story of how everything came to be. So in the beginning, there was just empty space. Not even these stars were shining, just a black void, devoid of color and texture, devoid of quality. And this beginning was at the threshold of a great ending, a grand cataclysmic implosion where everything that had existed previously had been reabsorbed back into the self back into that which the yogis call the Atman, that which shines in everything. So at the end of the cycle, everything collapsed back in to itself, and there was just peace stretching out in all directions. But within that deep void, there began a tiny little stir, a little twinge of a desire. The great self, the one who shines in everything as everything, the great light that encompasses everything that we perceive, that power that permeates everything. It wanted to experience itself again. It wanted to see itself again. So that tiny little desire started to grow. It started to expand. And there was a great churning. The eye started to shine out. And from that great void, the cosmos started to slowly form. One light started to expand and become many lights. Like one light being shattered and then scattered across an infinite sea, hidden inside of you and me. A little poetry. <laughs> this is all freestyle, by the way. <laughs> Seriously, off the cuff. So within this grand cosmic ocean, pools of stars, layers and currents, planets slowly forming like tiny pearls inside of oysters. Within this cosmic ocean, there was a great sound, a great vibration. 
And this sound was what was giving rise to everything. It was the hum of the self starting to speak. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And what's so incredibly beautiful about this is that it reminds me every day how powerful my words are. Words create worlds. I just recently came from Berlin. We were in Germany. We did a couple shows in Europe. And I got to see the Berlin Wall with my own eyes. This wall that had been built up based on ideas, words, which had separated and divided this country. And it was words, it was the graffiti, it was the chanting, it was the, the power of new ideas forming that collapsed that old wall. Was it Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall? Okay, I'm a product of the 80s. So the sound started to get louder and it started to echo and reverberate. And these are, a lot of these photos are photos that I took on my trip to India. And within this ocean of sound there appeared a beautiful, resplendent, radiant being. This is one of my wife's paintings, Amanda. And this is an image of Lord Vishnu, or Narayan. Narayan is the one who is said to dream the universe into being, lounging on his cosmic serpent Ananta, the one who stretches out infinitely. And his skin is made of the ocean. His skin is blue. It's transparent, porous, open. So that when he breathes, the entire universe sways through him. So he's not separate. He is the universe. And in his deep dream state, he starts to grow from his jeweled belly button, this lotus bud. And this lotus stalk starts to weave and sway and make its way up through the currents of this cosmic ocean. And it takes hundreds and thousands of years for this flower to bloom. But gradually, inevitably, ultimately, it breaks the surface of the water. And there's so much power inside this bud that it just explodes like spring. And hidden within this lotus is a little jeweled being covered in dew, covered in nectar. And as he slowly starts to peel his eyes open, he starts to gaze out at this infinite sea of stars and galaxies. And he's bewildered. He's stunned. He doesn't know who he is, where he is, or what he's supposed to do. So in this state of being deeply perplexed, he starts to ask the question, who am I? Why am I here? What is it that I'm supposed to do? Everywhere I look, I, I don't see anything. Just space. His name is Brahma. And Brahma is given the task of creating the world. He's known as the architect of the universe. He has many heads so that he can see in all directions. And Brahma, hearing a grand voice echoing throughout the ocean, he hears the voice and he says, Go within, meditate on the sound Om. Listen. And as Brahma closes his eyes and goes into meditation, it's another painting from Amanda. Here's Narayan. He understands his task, he hears the voice of what Gandhi calls the still, quiet voice within us. It's that voice inside of us that just knows. And it's much quieter than all the louder voices that are chattering on the surface. It's that little voice deep inside of us that just it knows what to do. It knows why we're here. And in going into meditation, chanting Om to himself, he follows and traces his mind back into that still, quiet space. He swallows his senses, absorbs his energy back in, and he remembers. There's a grand remembrance. He says, ah, yes, I'm supposed to create. It is my duty to create and fabricate all the forms of the universe. So the one having become the dreamer, the ocean, the jeweled being known as Brahma, he continues to expand, spinning the great wheel. Many, many beings are formed, including Ganesh, Great Lord of Beginnings, God of Wisdom. It's a little design I did. And from this one power, this one light, this multiplicity, myriad forms, all of us expand out in every direction. 
And what's so beautiful about the temples in India is you see all these characters so ornately carved, beautifully hand-painted, but they're all carved from the same stone. Everything we see is sculpted and carved from the same spirit, the same rock, the same light. And gradually, creation gets more complex, more interesting forms, more interesting dramas and dilemmas and tensions and problems. And this goes on and on and on. It's a really long story. So we're going to skip ahead several millennia. One day, Brahma, after seeing everything that he's created, he becomes really arrogant, full of himself. I mean, the guy's got four heads. So he's, I mean, big heads. Like he's feeling very pompous. He looks out. You know, he's got a hit record, viral videos, Twitter pages blowing up. Like everything is huge. Like everything he's done is just like incredible. And he looks out and he's like, wow, I'm so awesome. He's like, I am the best God, number one, numero uno. And as he's thinking this to himself, he encounters his old friend, Vishnu or Narayan. And in this mode of arrogance, he kind of stumbles into saying, Vishnu, he starts judging his friend. He says, you're so lazy. All you do is lounge around on your snake your serpent, always dreaming the world away while I'm hard at work making phone calls, sending emails, <laughs> making sure that all the plans pass and are up to code, the architecture of the universe. And he becomes so full of himself that he starts to hurl these nasty words at his friends. Has that ever experienced? Have you ever had that experience? Receiving it as well as giving it, right? So Vishnu always one to enjoy a great play, a great drama. Naturally, he's the sustainer of the universe. And if you know anything about music, you know that whenever you have something that's created, it needs to be sustained. So in yoga, there's this beautiful understanding that we need tension. That we don't want to escape tension. We don't want to escape problems. We just want to become better storytellers so we can create better problems and better tension. So Vishnu enjoys some good tension. So he says, okay, you think you're the best God? Brother, you create everything, but if it weren't for me holding it together, I am the glue. I am Vishnu. If it weren't for me, all your creation would fall to ash. It'd be nothing. Brahma gets heated. He gets really upset. And he starts to pull out deadlier and deadlier words. So in India, there's a practice of mantra. Mantra is words. Every word is a mantra. When we use our words to communicate, we're casting a spell. The story that we tell ourselves inside of our own mind is generally reflecting the story that we're telling everyone else around us. We are telling the story of our life. And if we're not mindful, we're going to use some really nasty words that can hurt people. That's why the tongue in the yoga tradition is considered a snake. It can lash out and bite people. But if you ever see like the Buddha or Ganesh or any of the great gods, mystic saints or holy beings, they always have the hood of the cobra over their head. It means that they've trained their tongue. They rest their tongue across the roof of the mouth so their tongue isn't lashing out at anyone, not even themselves. So the mantra that's being perpetuated in the back of the mind is a mantra that's perpetuating rapid blessings so that wherever we are in our vicinity, we're silently, quietly blessing everyone around us. That's mantra. But mantra is a double-edged sword. You can use mantra to hurt people too. So Brahma pulls out this deadly missile, this mantra, and he hurls it at Vishnu. Vishnu, seeing this coming at him, reactively pulls out his deadly mantra or missile and hurls it at Brahma. Now these words are so intense, so supercharged, that they have the power to destroy and obliterate all of creation. So as these nuclear missiles are hurling toward each other, it's like nuclear India and nuclear Pakistan. They're flying and everyone who's there, bearing witness, collectively gasps. <gasps> Knowing that when those points of the missile touch, Everything is going to be destroyed. So they make a beeline. They quickly go up to Mount Kailash, where Shiva is meditating. 
and they say, Shiva, Shiva, oh Lord Shiva, please help us. There's a great calamity that's happening. These two dear friends have hurled these nasty words at each other, and you are the only one who could remedy the situation. You are the supreme yogi. You are the all-encompassing self. Please. And Shiva, in his deep samadhi state, he opens his eyes and he says, don't worry, I know everything. My third eye can see 360 degrees. I'm on top of it. I got this. So in that moment, when those missiles are about to collide, a great pillar of light appears. And this pillar of light appears out of the blue, out of nowhere. Seeing this, Brahma and Vishnu are perplexed. They don't know where this pillar has come from. So in that moment, they're filled with awe, filled with splendor. That whole thing with the, like the TV thing, that made me super nervous. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens? The mind goes blank. Seeing this pillar of light, Brahma and Vishnu, they don't know where it's come from. They say, oh my God, where has this light come from? But soon the mind kicks back in. And Brahma says, okay, whoever can discover where this light comes from, he will be considered the best God, number one. So again, the ego creeps back in. So Vishnu says, okay, I'm going to take the form of a boar and I'm going to burrow down into the earth to find where this light begins. Brahma says, I'm going to hop on my white swan and fly into the heavens to see if I can discover where this light begins. So they go on this great pilgrimage. One flies up, one plunges down and in, and this goes on for hundreds and thousands of years. And by the way, this is all a metaphor for the yoga process of discovering where this light comes from that is the self. Many hundreds and thousands of years pass and gradually Vishnu makes his way back up to the surface. His tusk is broken, his body is steaming, he has a black eye, he's spent, beat, burnt. Brahma kind of flies back down on his swan. Broken wings, bent beak, same thing. Completely exhausted. At the moment when they return to the horizon line, in that moment appears Shiva. Brahma says to Vishnu, I don't know where this light comes from. And Shiva appears and says, I am the light. Not only am I the light, but you yourselves are also the light. We are of the same self in different forms. So why are you arguing about who's better? Why should the thumb think it's more important than the, the pinky? We need every aspect of the universe. Everyone serves a purpose. Everyone has a function. Everyone has a role. And if we're blind, if we're ignorant, we're going to think that our role is more important than someone else's. And then what happens? The universe spins into chaos. And it takes great yogis to bring the balance back, which is why we're here, why we do our practice. So this pillar of light, why I'm sharing this story with you, is because it represents the midline, the spine. And even more directly how it relates to my story is because where this story took place on earth is where I took my pilgrimage to India. So this light appeared, and here Shiva is the trident. So the trident can be seen as Shiva, Brahma, Brahma and Vishnu, G-O-D. G, the generator, Brahma, O, Vishnu, the organizer, and she, D, Shiva, the destroyer, the one who transforms and transmutes everything so that the cycle can begin again. Okay, and this directly relates to the two nostrils, a little Shiva graffiti, and here's Shiva with the royal family. So here's a picture of me and my good friend, uh, Robin Livingston, and this is at one of the Goprooms or towers of one of the oldest and biggest Shiva temples in the world. And just behind this temple on the horizon line, and you can see just a little hint of it here, is the great mountain Arunachala. And this mountain is said to be where the pillar of light appeared on earth, which absorbed all that negativity, all that frustration, all that chaos and stress. And this mountain is considered to be a mountain of fire, which consumes ignorance. So I made it my personal mission to go to India on this last trip like a journalist, some of the temple monkeys and to talk to every yogi that, I, that would give me the time of day, every sadhu, every priest, every scholar, and made sure that I asked the right questions. And I got a lot of different answers, but they all pointed toward the same thing. 
to some of the beautiful paintings that you see walking through the streets. So a lot of these images were taken along the base of the mountain. And the mountain is so, so amazing because pilgrims flock to this mountain from all corners, some of the sadhus. It's at the base of the temple. You can see how tall I am. It's like a mug shot. And this was inside of a, a puja, inside a temple room of a man who claimed to be 300 years old. And in India, you meet all these incredible characters, and you don't know if it's true or not, but it's such a great story. And you come to appreciate the story. And I asked him all kinds of interesting things, and he gave me all kinds of interesting answers, and I questioned all of his answers. Uh, this is my friend Robin, and this is inside, checking out all the mortis, all the statues. And I don't know, was anyone here from Manoj's talk that happened just before this? <laughs> the camera, camera crew was. <laughs> It was so awesome. If you get a chance, there's a, a great man here named Manoj who has a stall where he sells beautiful statues from India. And he is a wealth of information. You can ask him any question. He's just a beautiful guy, dear friend. And um, I highly recommend just taking a moment and saying hi um, and asking him about some of these statues. If you're interested in some of the iconography, some of the encoded, the ancients have encoded the teachings of yoga in these images for us to take benefit. Um, so here's Ganesh. This is one of the priests. And I'm just going to flip through some of these photos that I took to give you sort of like a snapshot of what it's like. This is on the, one of the holy rivers. Um, you encounter so many beautiful people in India. It's, there's so much life, so much love. Uh, and such a beautiful cosmology and understanding of the universe that's so ancient and deep that it makes for when there's great chaos, there's also a deep underlining layer of peace. Because on some level, we know that we've gone through all these problems before. And we're just doing them again for the sheer joy of it. So that we can understand and appreciate the drama of life. But, you know, nuclear annihilation, we've been talking about this for hundreds and thousands of years. It's a beautiful light in the temple. Uh, and this is some of my, my homies, Ram and Surrender. And this is my sort of, my, my good friends in India. I call them my, my Indian entourage. And... Whenever we were rolling through the streets, one of the things I love about India is that when you know a little bit about Sanskrit, when you know how important and powerful some of the names are, when you're saying your friend's name, Ram, which means the source of all spiritual joy and surrender, and all day long, we, just, we hung out the whole time, so all day long I'm saying, surrender, Ram, surrender, Ram, surrender, Ram, surrender, Ram, surrender, until it starts to click into the mind. Surrender to God, surrender to God, surrender to God, surrender to God. So the mantras are powerful, even just saying someone's name. There's so much in our namesake. Uh, this is one of the characters that I met along the base of the mountain. This was Silver Gandhi. And he was a cool guy, but he didn't look too happy because I don't think that that was very eco-friendly paint that he had covered himself with. But it was a very interesting... Uh... And so here we are at the base of the mountain, and you can see the throngs of pilgrims that that are attracted and pulled to the mountain, specifically during uh, November and December when there's a great celebration that happens. Uh, here's the chariot that gets wheeled through the city and the, there's an image of Shiva and Shakti inside that comes from the main temple. Now, interestingly enough, the word juggernaut comes from when the British came to India and there's a great temple in Puri where they celebrate and worship Lord Krishna and they bring him out on this chariot, and he comes out in the form of Jagannath, the non-stoppable power of love. And it's the one day when all the pilgrims and devotees go to the, generally would go to the temple to visit the icon. This is the one day of the year where the icon comes out to visit them. So it's a grand celebration, and everyone is just ecstatic. This is a similar procession that happens in the south. This is in Tamil Nadu. Um, and this is where the word Jagannath comes from, this unstoppable force it comes from Krishna. So here inside the Shiva temple, these clay pots are filled with ghee, clarified butter, which is a symbol for us as yogis, churning the butter until that which is most divine comes to the top, and camphor. And these clay pots are carried to the top of the mountain, which takes about four hours, barefoot, deadly snakes. Um, and as the pilgrims scurry up the mountainside like ants, they pour these clay pots onto the very peak of the mountain, and the mountain itself is lit into a candle. 
So you can imagine it's like Hanukkah and Christmas and Burning Man combined. <laughs> <laughs> the mountain is blazing. There's thousands of people swirling around the base creating this vortex of humanity. People are chanting and praying all ages. And the whole time, people are coming to this pilgrimage with the intention of not just burning their own karmas and their own suffering, but oftentimes people will go on a pilgrimage for their wife or for their husband or for their kids or someone that they love. So if there's a sickness in the family, they'll go and do this arduous journey or task to help relieve the suffering of their loved ones. And pilgrimage is considered one of the most popular forms of spiritual practice in India. Um, and so here's the five clay pots being lit, each one representing one of the five elements. And here's the pujaris or the priest doing the ceremony. And then here's the mountain itself. And you can see the great Shiva temple here. And this is the full moon. And here's the actual, this is, this is the torch that's on the top of the mountain. And you can see here, if you look, this is an image of Shiva and his wife Parvati or Shakti. And this is symbolic. Shiva represents the Purusha, the self, the all-seeing eye, the one who sees through all eyes. And Prakriti, the feminine, represents that which is being seen, the layers of earth. So in the yogic tradition, in one thread of this philosophical system, body, mind, thought, emotion are all considered forms of nature. And the seer is the one who is seeing all the changing, stirring of the universe, the great dance of the mother, the goddess. Another image of the torch on the top. Here's Shiva. Once a year they light the torch? Once a year, yeah. It happens generally during December, during the full moon. And this is the great Saint Ramana Maharshi who lived at the mountain. And he was considered one of the greatest saints. Doesn't he look so happy? He, he's considered one of the greatest saints of the 20th century. And he's revered throughout India and the world as being just a very simple, pure being who just loved everyone in his presence and was a man of little words very simple, simple, humble person, um, but very extremely powerful, allowing the light to shine through him as him. Right? And this is his room. This is where he passed. Uh, and this is me with my, my little friend Ram, another Ram, this is a friend of mine from Chile. And we're sitting on the mountain itself, looking down at the great Shiva temple. And so you can see how it sits in the center of the temple. And it's just a hub of activity. There's so much going on all day long. This is the mountain. And this is the, the image of the Morti that sits on the very top of the mountain. So here you guys are getting the vision or the darshan of what's on the mountain right now. This is at the very peak. So again, it takes about four hours to travel to the top. It's recommended you do it barefoot. I'm so glad no one told me there was poisonous snakes till afterwards because I don't know if I would have gone barefoot, but it was so worth it. And, um, and this was, actually this was me on the, on the top. And I don't know how we got this photo, but this is exactly how it felt. The energy was so powerful and so dense and so amazing. You can just imagine billions of people pouring their love and adoration into one mountain for thousands of years. Just imagine like the memory that's held in that rock. Um, and there's Shiva. And so this became the, um, this little Shiva, Shiva bull. This became the theme, and I, when, we, when we went to India, I, I planned on going and recording a record, but I didn't know that the whole album was going to be geared toward pilgrimage. It just kind of happened. Uh, and here you can see a little better perspective of the sadhus next to the GoPro or the temple tower. Um, and some of the merchants, some of the rickshaws. Here's Ramana. Uh, Chai Walla. And I'll share just another quick story with you guys. And this is a very personal anecdote of what happened on the mountain. And I've shared this with a few people, but not a lot of people know this. We were in Chennai, which is a very musical city in South India. And we had found this incredible studio called Clementine Studio that was run by some friends of ours. And we had set out to record this record. And we had worked, we made some phone calls and connected with some amazing master musicians, like people who play for Bollywood, session players, violinists. Uh, incredible percussionists, singers, made some incredible contacts, made some great friendships. Um, but in the process of recording, we decided, let's go see the mountain. 
So we all hopped in the car, little minivan with our driver, Rom, Surrender, my friend Robin, and we kind of made our way through the forest, through the jungle, through the rice fields with the music blasting, just having a great time. Uh, we stopped at every temple along the way that we could, talked to every, every sadhu, every priest. Um, there was one particular temple that we stopped at where we met this um, gentleman named Amun, who was worshipped as the mother. And I'd never met anyone, any man who was worshipped as a mother before, so it was really interesting. And he was a really cool, interesting guy. He's a little psychic. And so we'd sit down and he'd kind of hold court on his little plastic lawn chairs, and everyone would gather around. And he would just start like saying things to people. And I didn't speak Tamil, so my friends would translate for me. And he said this thing to my friend, Surrender. And I was like, Surrender, what did he say? And he says, he told me that I have a mole below my left nipple. And I was like, what? <laughs> he's like, and Surrender's like, yeah, I don't know what he's talking about. And so Surrender pulls up his shirt and he looks, and lo and behold, there it is. The, the triple nipple is right there. <laughs> and, he's, and I guess it's something only a mother would know, right? Is that, and he pulled up, and I was, I was just like, he was just like, I don't know, like he'd been practicing yoga for a while or what, but he was just like spitballing all this amazing information. I was like, whoa, dude, this is incredible. And so these are the kind of characters you meet along the way uh, whenever you go on a pilgrimage or a journey. I mean, it's different. Being a pilgrim is very different than being a tourist. Being a tourist, you kind of go and you want to, you know, sit on the beach and sort of like take from a place, right? Being a pilgrim, you go on a journey to discover who you are in relation to a different environment. Because we're so used to seeing and experiencing ourselves in the parameters of our life, right? Our home, our family, our, our community, coworkers. But to experience ourselves in a whole different space is to really start to see ourselves from a different perspective. And it's so incredible, you know, what comes out of that process. So much growth, so much inspiration. Um, and so we'll flick through a few more photos here. Images of Shiva, some of the fellow pilgrims on the path. I love in India, I'm such, I, I could do this, I could sleep anywhere. And in India, people just kind of sleep like, you know, wherever, they, wherever they're tired, they just kind of plunk down. This is uh, in a little further north, this is called the Poor Man's Taj Mahal. And this was built by the same architect who made the Taj Mahal, but this was made for, I believe, his mother-in-law. His mother-in-law or his mother, so it's a little smaller. It's not quite as big as the one he made for his wife, but it's still beautiful. Uh, this is another great saint called Bhagavan Nityananda, um, just north of Mumbai or Bombay, another great being. Um, some of the flower sellers, Sai Baba, another saint. Uh, and just go through so you can sort of experience some of the color. And this is, this is not Photoshop. This is a cow that's covered in turmeric. Uh, it was one of the holy festivals. This is actually in Mysore, India, where Amanda and I studied yoga with um, Patabi Joyce. Uh, and I mean, this is like, you got to do a double take. You know, in India, it's like you're walking through a technicolor dream. And, you know, for me, as like a, you know, a graffiti artist and a visual artist and a graphic artist, to me, it's just like, I'm so happy in India. Because it's just so, like, beautifully gritty and colorful, and the people are so nice and outgoing, and the food is so good. And you can just drink, like, 12 cups of chai a day, and it's just so much fun. This was at Gandhi's ashram up in the north where we spent some time. Um, and it was a really cool experience going from the Taj in Mumbai, which is one of the nicest, most plush, luxurious hotels in India, from there to Gandhi's ashram, which is like the most austere, simple, like back-to-earth uh, accommodations you can imagine. Like we literally slept in like a cow shed, got up like at five, did our chores, um, ate food with no salt, no seasoning, just very bland. Um, and it was really actually an amazing experience to get back to like, to really like feel the earth, to be that close. That's another image of Ganesh writing on his mouth. This is a beautiful image. Um, this is also at a temple in the south of a, the goddess of the harvest. And you can see she's holding a, a image of, she's holding a cob of corn. And I'm pretty sure it's not GMO corn. But, it, but in India, there's, you know, and actually in our culture as well, like there's a, a deep understanding. I remember my grandparents used to have this beautiful image above their dining room table, which had people praying for the, over the harvest. And I come from a very devout Catholic upbringing. Um, so this understanding of being grateful to the earth, and when we pray and offer love to the earth, we, it actually, we get a better harvest. It actually affects our food. Um, this is in the marketplace. Oh, sorry. This is actually one of the biggest monolithic statues in the world. This is a Jane Saint. 
Oh, sorry. And um, I had an incredible experience. This is another pilgrimage. We went up to the top of this mountain. This guy just towers at the top. Some of the images, um, sadhus inside the temple. Uh, this is at Gandhi's ashram. And this is a jaggery stall. These are actually blocks of sugar. And it's a type of natural sugar called jaggery, which is really, really sweet. Uh, it's a very acquired taste. It's a couple friends hanging out. This is Swami Vivekananda, one of the first yogis to come to America and, and give the teachings of yoga. We were there in Indiana's birthday, part of the parade. Um, some of the divine sort of spiritual graffiti. Nidra Swamiji. And I just kind of flick through this because you guys have been so awesome and so patient. Uh, this is another one of the sugar stalls. Merchants. Um, this is where our friends Amma. And you can see how amazing these, the painting is. Like everything... I mean, it's changing now because, you know, people are making like computer graphics and stuff, but there's still, you can walk through the streets and see all this hand painted, beautiful art, which just makes such a huge difference. Whoa, hey, oh. And, uh, and the, the trucks are painted, horn please. So, again, coming back to our story, these are all forms created from the one self. Sadhu is quick to offer you a blessing. Garlands in the marketplace at the great Hanuman Temple. If you hear the new album Pilgrimage, this is where we recorded the skit called Temple Drums. It's my friend Robin. Um, I call this one the Stock Exchange. So this is in the marketplace. Um, see there, um, this is a cobbler working on shoes. I call that soul repair. This is some of the Swamis from the Ramakrishna Vedanta Society. Uh, it's really easy to fall into meditation in India because there's so much momentum. It's like you can taste it in the air. So it's like really easy to drop in. And, and if you know a little bit about some, you know, the iconography of the deities, the gods and goddesses, you, you see it and you're instantly transported. So just having a little bit of knowledge goes a long way. Um, this is at the great Ganesh festival in Mumbai. So triple goddesses, Lakshmi, Saraswati, and Parvati. And the whole world is made of sound. This is the first concert I ever offered in India. This was about seven years ago. I gathered together a very ragtag band. Uh, one was an Indian tabla player, and the other one was a German percussion major who got some plastic pots, spoons, and tali plates. And it was just me performing my spoken word with them doing percussion to about 150 yogis from all around the world on this rooftop. And it was the first, it was like the inauguration of MC Yogi is the first time I'd ever performed as MC Yogi. is pretty awesome. Um, see some of the beautiful doorways. They're just so gorgeous. Another image of Sai Baba. Shiva. Whoa. And then I want to finish with um, just some of the great signage you see in India. Some of the incredible signs you see walking through the streets, walking through the mountains. I mean, it's so honest, you know? <laughs> it's like, I mean, when would, when would advertisers in the U.S. ever be that honest? You know, <laughs> you know it's a great invitation. <laughs> Maybe Jackie Chan stayed there. <laughs> this is if you want, <laughs> you want to get some beer for your children. This is a good place. English wine. Um, do not pluck flowers or trees. You know, you got to be pretty big to pluck trees, but it's a good <laughs> reminder. Uh, no hurry, no worry. It's such a great sign. So, yeah. so some of the roads are very treacherous. This is actually, these, I got these two off the internet. This is, this, I'm curvaceous, be slow. Um, got to be careful of that one. <laughs> Get your yogi toast on. And this one says, Visit for Meditation, Philosophy, Answers to Spiritual Questions, Indology, and Galactic Chronicles. <laughs> so I, I kind of feel like if you listen to the album Pilgrimage, it's sort of like my Galactic Chronicle. Uh, and that's it. I hope you hilariously enjoyed this last minute um, little journey, wanderlust through the streets of India, get a little backstory to what happened. Um, and oh, I, I didn't finish this one last story because this is this is really was the crux 
of the whole album because every story has its drama, right? Well, the drama of this story is we went to the mountain and we happened to be there on the new moon. Amazing. Went to the top of the mountain, just had the complete, most complete ecstatic experience. Came back down, hopped in the van, you know, went back to the studio in Chennai and I thought we were done. We went to the mountains, awesome, we did it. Well, as we were recording the record, one day out of the blue, something happened. I cannot explain it. A lightning pain shot my right hip and I just collapsed on the floor in my room of the apartment where I was staying in, in the most excruciating pain that I've ever felt in my entire life. And I was literally like laid up, like I couldn't move. I couldn't even crawl. And we had hired like a film crew, we had hired lighting rig, everything was going on. I was supposed to be directing and producing all of it. Uh, and so I, I couldn't do anything. The pain was just so intense. And gradually a couple days had passed and I gathered and mustered up the strength to slowly sort of get back up. And when I got back up, my whole body was as crooked as this. It was like a snake. And I had to use my friend Surrender and Ram's shoulders to walk. So I literally was chanting, Surrender to Ram, Surrender to Ram, Surrender. And my hosts who, who had, were putting us up, they were literally worried that I was never going to be able to walk straight again. And so I went inside and I went and tried to listen to the still small voice because whenever there's a dilemma, whenever there's a problem, it's an opportunity to go in and get the guidance. Why is this happening? This is appearing for a reason. You know, I don't want to pretend that I'm just a victim of the universe. This is happening through grace. There must be something here. So I went inside and I just listened and I heard the voice. And the voice said, go back to the mountain to go back to the mountain. So there was a storm brewing and we were sort of navigating, okay, are we gonna be able to go back or not? Cause really, you know, it's kind of dangerous to be out on these roads with these huge semi trucks and like people driving like mad people and you know, and I'm just all crippled in the back. So we kind of were checked the weather and okay, the storm's there, but it's gonna be okay, it's subsiding. Let's go tomorrow. So we all hopped back in the van and we kind of, again, burrowed through the streets, turned up the music, it was blast, and we got to listen to some of our mixes. You know, Robin, Surrender, Ram, our friend Anandurai, who was the driver. And when we got to the mountain, and I, none of this was planned. We were all just sort of like, you know, having a good time and we pulled up, slid the door open and stepped out in just silence. All, it was like that moment in Stand By Me. It just, everyone was just quiet. And we looked up and it was like or borealis, like the mountain had this luminous glow to it. And it was like this mountain of light. And I slowly got out limping and we began the pilgrimage. We began the production, the, the circumambulation around the base. It took all night, eight hours. Now what we didn't know was that it was the lunar eclipse. It was the full moon lunar eclipse. So it was like India was in full swing. Bands, music blaring, elephants, cows, monkeys, everything was just going off. And the energy was just like so powerful and strong. And so I took Ram and surrendered. Oh, our friend Kenji, yeah, our friend Kenji from uh, Japan was with us too, who played violin on the song Sunlight. And we started our journey around the base of the mountain. And I encountered some of the most incredible things around the base. We, there was this RV parked on the side with this old Indian couple. The husband was sleeping in the ditch and the wife was there and then the back of the RV, Ganesha, they, ha <laughs> they had this old like PC, like you remember the old computers? This huge computer in the back of the RV and you'd scan your fingerprints, they would like do like a carbon copy and then they'd run it through the scanner. It was like the slowest scanner you'd ever see, like <laughs> like I was there for like 30 minutes and gradually it reads it and it prints out like the cheesiest worst horoscope you've ever read in your life <laughs> it's like the most generic fortune you've ever seen but it's just hilarious and then we kept going and we saw this little boy who had these these two two or three cages of parakeets and the parakeets he'd bring them out and they would pull your your card and read your fortune with the birds um, and I don't know if you know this, but the word, where the word auspicious comes from is to be under the auspices of something means that you're, it's a good omen. And in ancient days, there was a practice of reading the migration patterns of the birds. 
And if you were having a question that was going on inside yourself, you could ask nature and nature would give you the answer. So it was being that connected to the self that we could read, read the signs. And so going around the base, that's where we saw the silver Gandhi and just met some incredible sadhus. But by the end, and we'd seen the full eclipse of the sun matching the moon with this mountain just blazing, by the end of this journey, I was in Samastitihi again. I was standing upright. I cannot explain it. It is not like, you know, I have nothing to sell. You don't ever have to go to this mountain. For me, that I got pulled to it. I felt a desire. Something pulled me there. But for whatever reason, these ancient practices work. They reconnect us with a part of ourselves that knows. A part of ourselves that remembers. And whether it's meditating or, or breathing or doing the practices here at the festival, like these, power, these practices are powerful. It's not just a superficial culture. You know, this, is, this, this, this practice has the ingredients to save us on this earth at this time. To get us back to love, back to what's important. To tear these walls down and build new worlds. So I'm so grateful to all of you for, for just listening, going on this journey with me, for being here. And uh, I want to thank you guys for doing the, for filming C3. And uh, I want to wish you the, an amazing rest of the festival. Enjoy your yoga. Drink a lot of water. Go say hi to my friend Manoj. Uh, enjoy the music. We'll be performing tomorrow night, Saturday, before Ziggy Marley. Uh, we opened for Ziggy Marley in um, Vermont, and he was awesome. Like, literally, it's like watching Bob Marley, dude. I'm not kidding. Like, it is amazing. So you guys are in for a huge treat. Great weekend. Thanks to everyone at Wanderlust for putting this together. And thank you guys for being here. <laughs> <laughs>